الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سبلنا وإن الله لمع المحسنين صدق الله العظيم We begin in Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him and we beseech Him this night for His guidance and for His blessings and for His protection as we attempt to address the subject Islamic spirituality, the forgotten path. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam our subject tonight is spirituality and our subject tomorrow night inshallah will be dajjal the false messiah and yet we begin tonight with dajjal to show the link between tonight's talk and tomorrow night. The Prophet said sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, every Prophet of Allah has warned his people about Dajjal. But I'm going to tell you something about him which none has said before me. Dajjal sees with his left eye he is blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord is not one-eyed. Between Dajjal's eyes on his forehead is written Kafir, Kafara. And every mu'min that is, every believer whose Islam has entered into his heart, and so it has become Iman, every mu'min will be able to read and recognize kafir. Whether that mu'min is katib, he can read and write, or ghayr katib, he cannot read, he cannot write. he still be able to read. This is by far the most important hadith on Dajjal. Since this information was saved until the very last. No more prophets after Muhammad What is the implication? If the, the mu'min can read, it means that Abu Lahab can't read. Huh? But Abu Lahab has a pair of eyes. How come he can't read? But Ali radiallahu ta'ala who could read. Is it that Ali radiallahu ta'ala who isn't reading with these eyes? Do we have any other eyes beside these eyes? The University of Singapore says no. United Nations says no. Governments around the world say no. We have no other eyes beside these eyes. We have no other ears beside these ears. We have no other means of acquiring knowledge other than through the senses, through observation, and through the rational faculty. But the Quran says yes. In addition to these eyes, we have all, we have internal eyes. 
In addition to these airs, we have internal airs. In addition to our external faculties for acquiring knowledge, we can also acquire knowledge internally. For example, in Surah Al-Hajj, now if you want to teach this subject, make sure you memorize. Brother Imran is going, not going to be here forever. You have to teach the subject when he's gone. So memorize. Surah Al-Hajj. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the people who, like Uncle Sam, internally dead. And he says, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Will they not travel to the earth? فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا So that perhaps, perchance, by traveling to the earth, the dead heart might come alive. PhD from Harvard, yes, but the heart is dead. The heart is dead. Multimillionaire with a dozen Mercedes Benz, yes, but the heart is dead. Travel to the earth and see the signs of Allah on the earth. And perchance by seeing the signs of Allah, your dead heart might come alive. فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا And when the dead heart comes alive, then the heart can understand what the intellect and reason could never understand. أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا When the heart comes alive, the heart can hear what otherwise could not be heard. فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَ الْأَبْصَارِ Truly, it's not these eyes which are blind. وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَ الْقُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي السُّدُورِ What is blind is the heart which is inside the chest. And so the heart can see. And so in addition to this eye, we also have this eye. Now it is possible for us to understand the hadith. Dajjal sees with one eye, his left eye. The left eye symbolizes his external capacity for sight. The Dajjal is blind in the right eye, indicating that the Dajjal is internally blind. And therefore that all those who follow the Dajjal will all be internally blind. What is the price that we pay? if we are internally blind. PhD from University of Singapore, but inside, blind. What is the price that we pay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that huge numbers of people are condemned for the hellfire. What did they do? That they are condemned for the hellfire. لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have hearts, but they cannot understand. A people who are internally blind are a people who in the age of Dajjal are destined for the hellfire. How does Allah describe such a people? He says, Ula'ika kal an'am. They're just like cattle. What? With a PhD from MIT? Yes. Yes, just like cattle, ulaika kalanam, balhum adal. Rather, they are more misguided than cattle. Ulaika humul ghafilun. These are the ones who are truly heedless, heedless of the signs of Allah. This is our introduction to spirituality in Islam. Spirituality is the path through which the heart comes alive. And when the heart comes
comes alive, then the heart can see and the heart can hear and the heart can understand what rationality can never penetrate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Surah Al-Kahfi in the Quran, Surah number 18, the cave. And the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam identified this surah as the only surah in the Quran which protects from Dajjal. Recite the first ten ayat of Surah Al-Kahfi over Dajjal and he won't be able to harm you. Hmm? But he said something else about Surah Al-Kahfi. You know, these eyes can't see unless there is light. Huh? Similarly, this eye cannot see without nur. Can't buy that nur in the stock market. No? Where does the nur come from? Allahu nur samawati wal art. Allah encompasses the totality of the nur in the heavens and the earth. You cannot get nur other than from Allah. Not even from the Security Council of the UN. You can't get nur. Only from Allah. So if we are to be protected from Dajjal and therefore to be able to see with the internal eye because he does not see with the internal eye we need nur. He said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, recite Surah Al Kahfi on a Friday. And it will deliver to you nur from the heavens to the earth. And that nur will stay with you until the next, until the next Friday. So now I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Let me see how many people have recited Surah Al-Kahfi last Friday. What happened to your hands? Something wrong? Huh? Shall I come back to lecture in this masjid? This is the dearest masjid in Singapore for me. Fourteen years ago when I came to Singapore for the first time, I came as a guest of this masjid. I lectured here in this masjid for the first time. I slept in a room at the back there. Hmm? Most of those who were with me at that time have all passed away, but Haji Abdul Majid is still here. Alhamdulillah. So this masjid is the dearest of all. It is named after Mas Molana Abdul Alim Siddiqui. Do you know who he was? My teacher, my sheikh, my murshid, was Molana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah whose masterpiece, the two volumes, the Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society is now available. I don't know if there are any copies still left outside. His teacher, his sheikh, his murshid, was Mawlana Abdul Alim Siddiqui, rahimahullah. So I'm the second generation from him. Hmm? The link between me and him. So next time I come, I want to see your hands raised that you are now reciting Surah Al-Kahfi every Friday without fail. Insha'Allah. In Surah Al-Kahfi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us wonderful instruction on the subject of the consequences of not having the capacity to see with the internal eye. He takes Musa alayhi salam, the Nabi who was sent to Banu Israel, who say that they are the chosen people of Allah. All the rest of mankind are just Gentile. We are the chosen of Allah. We are the elite. We are the select. Musa alayhi salam has delivered a khutbah. And this story is in Sahih Bukhari. They are in Sinai and he delivers a khutbah. And it's a wonderful khutbah. So someone came to him and asked him, Oh Musa, 
alayhi salam, what a wonderful khutbah. You must be the most learned man in the world. Hmm? What he should have said was, praise is due to Allah. What he should have said was, all knowledge comes from Allah. What he should have said was, فَوْكَ عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Beyond any learned man is he who is all learned. That is what he should have said. But he didn't say that. He said was the, what the PhD from the University of Singapore says. He says, yes, I am the most learned man in the world. This is, happen, this is what happens when you secularize knowledge. You take Allah out of the process of learning. He has nothing to do with it. I am the expert in my field. I'm the top scholar in my field. He says, yes, I am the most learned scholar in the world, the most learned man in the world. When you do that, when you do not recognize Allah as the source of knowledge, then he cuts off your internal sight. Can't see. Tabuli. So now Musa, alayhi salam, temporarily is without internal sign. And then Allah says to him, There is a servant of mine more learned than you are, Musa. Alayhi salam. So Musa, alayhi salam, says, I'd like to meet him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the instructions to take a fish, put it in a basket, travel in the direction where the two seas meet. Majma'ul Bahrain where the two oceans meet. And when the fish jumps out of the basket, there you meet him. This is a rather humiliating thing for the most learned man in the world to do, put a fish in a basket, and I'm the most learned man in the world. This is the way I'm going to meet him. Allah cuts him down. Cuts him down. Learn humility. If you really are learned, the sign of knowledge is humility. So he goes, and eventually he meets him. He's called Khidr, alayhi salam, which means green. This is a man more learned than Musa, alayhi salam. And there's a difference between his knowledge and this knowledge. This knowledge can grow old and grow stale and be superseded by other knowledge and so become obsolete, like the computer you had ten years ago, obsolete now. But this knowledge remains always green. This knowledge is always vibrant, always relevant, always fresh, like a fresh breeze. This is the knowledge of Khidr alayhi salam. That's why he's Mr. Green. Musa alayhi salam asks, can I accompany you so I can learn from you? But it's difficult, really difficult for a one-eyed man to learn from a two-eyed man. Really difficult. He has his PhD, you see, from MIT. So he believes he knows all. Khidr Islam says, you ain't going to be able to show patience with me. How correct was that answer up to this day? But he keeps on insisting, I want to go with you. Okay, you can come along. But on the condition, don't ask any questions unless I explain to you. Shut your mouth. Cut him down. And so they travel. And then they come to the sea or the water. And there they board a boat. Sahih Bukhari tells us a nice story about what happened on the boat. A little bird came and sat on the, on the sail of the boat 
And then the, bo the bird flew down, dipped its beak into the water, and flew back up with one drop of water inside the mouth. Khidr alayhi salam points to the bird and he says to him, Musa, the knowledge that you have plus the knowledge that I have when compared to his knowledge is like the one drop of water in the beak of the bird when compared to this vast ocean of water. That is the first lesson to teach the one-eyed man. <laughs> and then three events occur. First of all, Khidr al-Islam takes a rod and he, he, he scuttles the boat, breaks, breaks the bottom of the boat. And Musa al-Islam is quite annoyed. Why do you do such a wicked thing? And then secondly, when they get off the boat, they come across a boy and Khidr al-Islam kills the boy. And now Musa al-Islam is more than just angry because he remembers that he accidentally killed a man in Egypt. And what suffering he suffered because of that. So he's very angry now. He's demanding an explanation. Why did you do this? This boy is innocent. And then they came to a town which was very inhospitable. Would not offer any hospitality. Very much like lower Manhattan. And uh, not even if they're prepared to pay for it, these people would not show hospitality to Khidr al-Islam and Musa al-Islam. Probably think they're terrorists. <laughs> but there's a wall which someone had constructed. And this wall was crumbling. And Khidr al-Islam, from his own pocket, he pays for the wall to be rebuilt. And Musa can't understand. Why would you pay to do this in a town which does not show even elementary hospitality? You could at least demand a refund of the amount that you have spent. What is important about these three events is that on each occasion, Musa alayhi salam formed his judgment based on external observation. External observation and rational analysis. And yet, on all three occasions, he was wrong. Surah Al-Kahf is knocking at your hearts, warning you, warning you, Singapore, that in the age of Dajjal, if you depend only on your external observation and rational investigations to formulate your judgment, you will be wrong. Why? Because the Jal comes with two things, a river and a fire. But his river is a fire, and his fire is the cool waters of a river, said the Prophet ﷺ. In other words, that appearance and reality will be completely different from each other in the age of Dajjal. It looks good, but it ain't good. It's dangerous. It looks bad, but the reality is different. It is good, just like durian. <laughs> 
You don't judge a durian by the external smell. Huh? You judge the durian by the internal taste. The external smell belongs to hell. Although some people would disagree with me. But internal taste belongs to heaven, although some people might also disagree with me. Anyhow. In the age of the Dajjal, appearance and reality are going to be completely different from each other. And so if judgment is based on external observation and rational inquiry alone, you're going to be wrong. And you'll pay a terrible price for your wrong judgment. Khidr alayhi salam explains, he says, this boat, what appeared to you to be bad was actually good. There is a king, a government which is coming, seizing people's property. And they're going to be seizing this boat. By scuttling the boat, damaging it, I saved the boat. So when the king is gone, then the poor fishermen can repair their boat. It looked bad to you, but actually, I did them a favor. This little boy, you sometimes plant a seed, and you get a rose. And sometimes you plant a seed, and you get a scorpion. So when you sleep with your wife, make dua, oh Allah, the seed which I plant, grant that it may grow into something good and beautiful. I mean, Rabbi habli min as Hmm? So, this child was destined to grow into such a devil that his parents' fate would have been threatened. And by killing the child and praying to Allah to send them another child who would be kurra to ayun for them. I was doing something good for them, but you couldn't see that. And this wall... You see this town? In this town there was a mu'min, a believer, who was dying. He had two little children. Orphans, they're going to be orphans. And he had some money. But just like lower Manhattan, he couldn't find a single person he could trust. None. Who can I give this money to? And ask them, please keep it until my children grow up. You can't trust a single person in that town. Is Singapore like that? Hmm? So what he did was he had to dig a hole. Because he couldn't trust anybody. And bury the money. If you want to do that, make sure nobody is looking. Eh? And then having buried the money... He then built a wall and prayed to Allah that when his children grow up, that Allah will guide them to the money. And since the wall was crumbling, my Lord instructed me to do this, Musa, alayhi salam. And so knowledge can come from above. And instructions can come from above. And guidance can come from above. But Uncle Sam doesn't believe that. What we are introduced to here is a branch of knowledge which is called epistemology. What is knowledge? Is it possible for us to acquire knowledge? And how is knowledge acquired? Hmm? The Quran teaches us if you acquire knowledge that knowledge wherein there is no doubt never becomes obsolete, like the computer from ten years ago. Kalla law ta'allamu yakin. If you had that knowledge which is born of certainty, knowledge which comes directly from Allah, you'll be able to see the hellfire. 
Hmm? And so, yes, knowledge is possible. But remember that knowledge doesn't only come this way. It also comes this way. Remember that in, in addition to knowledge externally derived, knowledge is also internally, intuitively, spiritually acquired. The companions were sitting, talking amongst themselves, and the Prophet came and sat with them, alayhi salatu wasalam, in the masjid. And this was after the farewell hajj. They had re returned to Medina. And so he has only about 81 days left in his blessed life. This is the last part of his life. When suddenly a stranger entered into the masjid, dressed all in white, black hair, spotlessly clean, no dust upon him, yet no one could recognize who he was and he was not a traveler. So what happened? He dropped out of the sky? This is mystery. This is suspense. This is drama that will continue to remain with us until the end of the world. Who is this man? And he came and sat directly in front of the Prophet and asked five questions as though he's a schoolmaster. And the Prophet replies. And every time he would reply, this man would say, your answer is correct. He's a schoolmaster. But this is the messenger of Allah. And after asking the questions, he got up and he left as suddenly and as strangely as he had come. And then the Prophet asked, do you know who he was? So we said, we said, Allah and his messenger, you know best, we don't. He said, this was Jibrail alayhi salam. The first time, the only time, the last time in history that the angel Jibrail alayhi salam appeared in front of everybody. And everybody could see him as a human being. It never happened before. And it will not happen again. The only time. For well, this is history. If you forget this, you pay a price for it. This is history. Question one was, what is Islam? Question two was, what is Iman? And then came question three. What is Al-Ihsan? I wish that they had not invented the word Sufism. Really. There was no need for it. I wish that the term Tasawwuf had never been invented. My life would have been easier. Easier. Whoever did it, whatever be the reason why he did it, did something which was wrong, should not have been done. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has himself given us the word. And the Quran tells us, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا Those who strive and struggle make jihad in us to reach us. لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ subulana. We will guide them to the paths which lead to us. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And Allah is ever with those who struggle for Al-Ihsan. Al-Ihsan. And the Prophet is asked, what is Al-Ihsan? So it is there in the Hadith and it is there in the Quran. Al-Ihsan is Tasawwuf. There is no difference between the two. Why then did we need the term tasawwuf? So that people could accuse us of bid'ah and haram? Huh? 
I agree with Dr. Israr Ahmad of Pakistan, the Amir of Tanzimi Islami, who has argued that we should use the terminology which is given by Allah and His Messenger, Al Ihsan, and do not use any other terminology. I agree with him. The Prophet replied, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, and he said of Al Ihsan, he said, it is an ta'abud Allah ka'annaka tarah. That you should worship Allah, that you should serve Allah, as though you are seeing Him. For in lam takun tarah, for if you cannot see Him, for innahu yarak, surely He is seeing you, and you should have that consciousness. But when Musa alayhi salam went up the mountain, Mount Sinai, did he not ask? I told you last night, the test of true love in the heart. If you say you have love in your heart, then you would long with a great, 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 great longing to see the face of the one you love. If you had to wait a thousand years, you will wait, even for a glimpse of the one you love. If you have to walk a thousand miles, you would do it gladly, just even for a glimpse of the face of the one you love. This is love. And so Musa alayhi salam says, Arini. Anzur ilayk. Show me your face. I want to see you. This is love. He replies, and he says, Lancharani, no Musa, alayhi salam. You can't see me. Meaning, now with these eyes, you can't see me. But the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, they ask, O Messenger of Allah, will we be able to see Allah on the last day, the day of judgment? He responded and he asked, do you have any difficulty in seeing the sun when it is the middle of the day? They said, no problem, we can see. He asked, do you have any difficulty in seeing the moon when it is full moon? Full moon? They said, no, no difficulty. He said, that's how you're going to see your Lord on the last day. Allah says, you can't see me. And the Prophet says, we will, you will see him. Hmm? Now we can understand that there is no contradiction here. The meaning is, you can't see me with these eyes. No? But do we have any other eyes beside these eyes? The Quran says yes. The heart can see. And so it is with the heart that we will see Allah on the last day. How can the heart see? We said, in order for the heart to see, it must first embrace Islam, the truth. Only the truth will deliver internal sign. Okay? Tell that to Washington for me. And then, after you've embraced the truth, the truth must travel from your lips and enter into the heart. And then it is called Iman. In order for it to enter into the heart, we have to live the truth. We have to live the truth with sincerity. We will be tested. We must pass the test. The only way can buy a house. The only way 
I can buy a flat in Singapore is to take a bank loan on interest. There is no other way. You lie. You should be ashamed of yourself for lying when you say there is no other way. When the angels are taking such people into the hellfire and the angels ask, Fima Kuntum, what went wrong? How come you landed in this mess? Are we taking you into the hellfire? And then you reply, well, there was no other choice for us. There was no other way we could buy a flat except with a bank loan on interest. And then the angels ask, this is Surah Nisa. Alam takun ardullahi wasi'a fatuhajiru fiha. Was Allah's earth not wide that you could have searched somewhere on Allah's earth where I can live without disgracing Him, where I can live without betraying Him into the hellfire. And so you will be tested. And only when you pass the test will Allah put the truth in the heart. In order for the heart to accommodate the truth, the heart must now be cleansed and purified. This is called tazkiya, internal purification. And then, after the heart has been purified, and the heart is turned to Allah, not to the Toyota Camry, to Allah, then Allah will put nur into the heart. And now you can see what otherwise you could never see. Surah to nur of the Quran, ayah number 35, is the most important ayah of the Quran, teaching us the methodology for spiritual growth, teaching us the way through which we can learn to see with the internal eye when we are spiritually mobilized. Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Mathalu nuri hi kamishka. The example by which you could understand his light is that of a niche in the wall where you used to put a lamp before the electricity came. In that niche in the wall, there is a lamp. But Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that the Prophet said sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam that that mishkat or that niche is not in the wall, it's here in the, heart, in the chest. So a space within the chest. And in that space there is a lamp. I can't do it now, but when you teach this lesson, what you do is you turn off the lights and you get a lamp, an oil lamp, and you light it. And you have all the children sitting there. And they'll be looking at the lamp now as you teach the lesson. And they will never forget that lesson for the rest of their lives. I warn you. This is the way to teach it. Al-Misbahu fi Zujaja, the lamp, has a glass around it. Al-Zujaja tu ka'annaha kawkabun durriyu. The glass is so spotlessly clean that it glitters like a shining star. And so now, the process of internal purification is to look to see the stains on the glass within your own heart and start to cleanse them, purify them, wash them out. The process of washing away the stains on the glass is first of all to recognize that we have committed sin. Secondly, to turn away from the sin. That's called tawbah. But when you turn you must turn with sincerity. 
Don't turn in the daytime and turn back in the night time. Huh? Tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuha. Turn away from the sin. Turn to Allah and do it with sincerity. Having turned away from the sin, now in your heart there must be regret for what you did. Nafsullawama. Reproach. How could I ever have done that? I am ashamed of myself. O oh my Lord, kindly put a cover over the sins I have committed because I am ashamed of them. Weep for the things you did yesterday. Now you must commit yourself never again to return to them. And when you give your word, keep your word. And then one last thing remains. You must now spend the rest of your life teaching others, helping others, guiding others, warning others that they do not walk on that path of sin. If you do that, then Allah is prepared to forgive all sins. And so he wipes it away and the glass becomes clean. But sometimes we think the stain is gone. You know, I think I did it. That stain is gone, the one called lust. But in fact, it is not as yet gone. I still have more work to do. How will I know that the stain is not as yet gone? This was last night's lecture. How will I know? Dream. In my dream, I'll commit the sin again. <laughs> and so that dream is telling me that the stain is still there. Go back and wash. After the glass has been cleaned and the stains have been removed, then the Prophet said that these hearts, they get rust. The dust accumulates. So in addition to cleaning, you also have to polish. You also have to keep on constantly polishing. What is the polish for the glass? He said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, he said that the polish is zikr. Zikr is the polish. What is zikr? Zikr has its external forms in which you recite mechanically. That's the external form of zikr. But the real zikr is internal. Zikr is remembrance. Remembrance is most of all the remembrance of the one you love. When you truly love someone, then that love will go with you wherever you go. Yes? That love is there in your heart at all times. If you are standing, it's there. You sit down, it's there. You lie down, it's still there. Whenever the memory of the beloved enters into the heart, it's like a fragrance coming into the heart. Khushbu. Whenever the memory of the Beloved enters into the heart, you are transported to another world. This is zikr. Zikr is not zikr of the Toyota Camry. Zikr is the zikr of Allah. Do you love me? He asks. Do you really love me? Do you love me as much as your dog loves you? Are you as faithful to me as your horse is faithful to you? Do you serve me as well as they serve you? Do you show as much courage in doing my work as they do in doing your work? 
والعاديات ضبحا فالموريات قدحا فالمغيرات صبحا فأثرنا به نقعا فوسطنا به جمعا The horses that you love so much and they run so fast they're panting and when they run in the night time their hoofs hit on the stones and the sparks are flying and when the morning comes and the fresh breeze enters into their lungs they run with a new spurt of speed and when they face the enemy they dash into the very center of the ranks of the enemy فَوَصَطْنَ بِهِ جَمْعًا Do you love me as much as they love you? Do you serve me the way they serve you? Are you loyal to me the way they are loyal to you? إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُودٍ No, you don't. You are ever negligent of your relationship with me, Allah is saying. Your dog loves you more than you love me. Your horse is more faithful to you than you are to me. Inna al-insana li rabbihi lakanood. Who are those who will live for Allah tonight? Who are those who will live for Allah? Only those who live for Allah, only they will die for Allah. They call that fundamentalism. <laughs> They call that terrorism. Hmm? And so, as the love for Allah enters into the heart, and the servant sets his sight, this is my goal. I am 20 years of age. Come back and see me. 40 years from now, you will still see me walking on this same road. Going in the same direction 40 years from now. Consistency in his life. This is my goal. This is my mission. Zikr is what delivers that. And that zikr polishes the glass. The, the, the verse of the Quran continues. that this lamp has an oil which comes from the tree which is zaytun, olive tree, and which is the blessed olive tree, which is la sharqiyya and la gharbiyya. It belongs neither to the east nor to the west. It stands firmly for Allah. Qul inna salati wa nusuki وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ When you have a person who lives for Allah like that, and who works and struggles and sacrifices in the way of Allah, then you produce oil. That oil is pure oil. يَكَادُ زَيْتُهَا يُضِيءُ وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَسُّنَا This is different from the oil you put in your muruka. This one, even though fire has not as yet touched it, it's already glowing. Can you imagine what's going to happen when fire touches it? You will not grow spiritually until fire touches you. Hmm? When fire touches you and the oil is already there inside of you, Now you have light. Noorun ala noor. I said it. That light does not come from the stock market. Allah gives it. Yahdillahu li noorihi may yasha. Allah guides to his noor whomsoever Allah chooses to guide. Wa yadribu Allahu al amthala lil nas. And Allah is presenting these lessons to mankind that they may reflect over it. Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim. And Allah has knowledge of all things. And therefore the noor is for ilm. And therefore the essential goal 
of the spiritual quest is knowledge which comes directly from Allah. When you have that knowledge, when you have that capacity for internal, intuitive, spiritual knowledge, what do you use it for? How important it is? Where do you apply it? This is the last part of the epistemological lesson. The, the stranger asks question four. When will the last day come? And he replied, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, and he said, the one who is being questioned has no more knowledge than the one who is questioning. So next question, please. Hmm? That's the way we respond. Anyone who wants to engage us on this subject, only Allah knows. Only Allah knows when the world will come to an end. None of us knows. I said in my previous lectures, by my calculation, using the hadith and using external observation, that I expect sometime within the next 50 years that the Muslim army will come and destroy the state of Israel. One fellow responded to me from Pakistan. He says, Sheikh, I can't wait for 50 years. That's too long. <laughs> it's too long. <laughs> this next 50 years are going to be the worst in our history. The greatest suffering, the greatest oppression will come these next 50 years. The wickedness of the wickedness of the wickedness of the people will be the rulers of the people. And mercilessly and shamelessly will they be attacking Islam while hiding behind a curtain called terrorism. So watch it. If you want to be a part-time Muslim, no problem. No problem. But the minute you want to be a true servant of Allah, they're coming after you. When they come after you, you better have protection from Allah. If you're not reciting Surah al kaf every Friday, they're going to cut you down. They're going to cut you down. But while it is only Allah who knows when the last day will come, the Quran tells us that the heart of the believer always feels that it is close. While the disbeliever always thinks it's far away. And then came question five, which teaches us the application of spirituality of al -Ihsan. How do you apply it? What is his practical utility? The stranger asked, what, what are the signs of the last day? And the Prophet replied and he said, number one, two things. He said, number one, you will find a naked, barefooted shepherd, meaning people who have the brains, the intellectual acumen of naked, barefooted shepherds, you will see them competing with each other to build high-rise buildings. I have the tallest building in the world. They have the intellectual acumen of naked, barefooted shepherds. Why? Because they measure progress this way. When we have built the tallest building in the world and we have built the grandest airport in the world and we built all these PR projects which makes our place look like heaven, we have achieved progress. And so they measure progress with PR projects. And Allah says, in akramakum indallahi atqakum. You should not measure progress with high rise buildings. Rather, measure progress with how much fear of Allah is there in the heart. You have none. Yes, you built the tallest building, but you have no fear of Allah in your heart. 
So you and all those who stand with you represent no progress at all. But he is underneath a mango tree, making shoes as a shoemaker. But in his heart there is the fear of his Lord. He is superior to you. When you see a world acclaiming those who build these high-rise buildings, the tallest building in the world, and the world considers that to be progress, and the world looks down upon this one who has the fear of Allah in his heart. You know, that is a major sign of the last day. But how many can see it today? <laughs> and how many are fooled today? Hmm? And then he came to the last one. He said, you'll find that a slave woman will give birth to her mistress. How can a slave woman give birth to her mistress? Hmm? Shall I leave you to think about it until tomorrow night? Huh? How can a slave woman give birth to her mistress? The only one who will be able to see that sign of Allah when it comes in the world. A major sign of the last age. The only one who will be able to see it and recognize it is not the one who has the PhD from Al-Azhar University but inside has nothing. It is the one who sees with two eyes who has knowledge externally derived and who has knowledge internally derived. This is the most learned of all men. And so when Musa asked, where can I meet him? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, go. And you will find him at the place where the two oceans meet. Majma'ul Bahrain. It is the commentator of the Quran, Baydawi. He is the only one who has penetrated the meaning of it. He said that the two oceans are the ocean of knowledge externally acquired and the ocean of knowledge internally acquired. When these two oceans of knowledge combine together in one man, combine together harmoniously, they're integrated together, you have the most learned of all men. Such a man was Maulana Muhammad Abdul Alim Siddiqui, Rahimahullah, after whom this masjid was named. And such a man was his student and my teacher, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah. We are just little candles glowing from the light which came from these great scholars of Islam. It is when you use these two oceans to combine together that you can crack it. A slave woman giving birth to her mistress. I'm going to be brief because it's already 10 o'clock. In order to understand this, you need two things, which come from Dajjal, through which Dajjal attacks to try to take control of mankind. One, the Prophet said that the age of Dajjal will be the age of Kathra to Riba. That Riba will take control of the world in the age of Dajjal. What happens? When riba takes control of an economy, is that number one, the rich will remain permanently rich and the poor will remain permanently poor. Wealth will no longer circulate. Number two, the rich will grow richer and the poor will grow poorer and the number of poor will constantly increase until they reach to the depths of that destitution. In other words, a new slavery descends upon mankind and that has already come 
while the ulama of Islam have been eating halwa. It has already come upon us. Nobody teaches the subject of the prohibition of riba. Nobody. I had the good fortune to live in New York, the capital city of riba. <laughs> and there I was able to put book knowledge to bear upon the real economy in the world today. In addition, I was blessed to study Western economics, international monetary economics, for example, in Europe. And this was how Allah blessed me with some understanding of the subject. That's why you will find my book outside, The Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah. It took me four years to write that book. When an economy is based on riba, then wealth will no longer circulate. It's like mankind traveling on a ship. 15% of the population of mankind traveling first class with permanent first class tickets. Huh? Best drinking water, best food, servants to save them, luxury. The other 85% down in the hole of the ship, living in squalor, living in misery, living in suffering, living in destitution, falling ill like flies and dying like flies. Hmm? So they are slaves down there. That's Indonesia today. That woman therefore is a slave woman down in the hole of the ship. She's the one we're talking about. In the age of Dajjal not only do we have riba but something else. The last people to come out of Dajjal will be women, said the Prophet ﷺ. Dajjal will weave such a web of brainwashing of women that a man would have to return to his home and tie down his wife and sister and daughter to protect and preserve them from Dajjal. They're brainwashed. Nothing you can say to them will change their minds. Brainwashed. This is the modern feminist movement. What does the modern feminist movement want to do? If nowhere else in the world you should be able to answer that very easily, Singapore, this country. The modern feminist movement challenges the notion that men and women are functionally different. That men have different basic functions from women. The modern feminist movement wants to remove the barriers. Anything a man does, a woman should have the freedom to do it. And so women embrace the functional role of men in the feminist revolution. But she is too poor to do it, the one down in the hole. The ones who do it are the elite, they're rich. These are the first to embrace the functional role of men, the women traveling first class. What happens when women go out to work the way men do? Seven o'clock in the morning, she's dressed to go to work the way he is. And she comes back home in the evening, six o'clock, seven o'clock, the same way that he does. And when she dresses to go to work, this is not going to a party, it's going to work. So she has to dress in working clothes, and working clothes must look masculine. So now the cut of the clothes, jacket, and trousers, and you wouldn't believe it, I also saw the tie. So her dress becomes masculine. When she goes to work and she gets in a position of some authority, she has people working under her. You can't be shy. You've got to talk like a man now. You've got to behave like a man now so that you can command respect. Hmm? Ah. But in the Quran, Allah describes women differently. Musa alayhi salam 
Remember how he drew the water for the girls? And then one of them came back. Father sent, him, sent her back, go call him. And she has to come and approach this man. A woman approaching a man. And Allah describes in the Quran how shy she was. How bashful she is. That she has to approach a man. But Uncle Sam's daughter ain't shy. Huh? That's for Kampong. We are modern women. So they behave like men, they dress like men, they talk like men, and even the faces begin to look like the men, faces of men. I don't want to mention the name of anybody in Mr. Clinton's cabinet. <laughs> huh? The softness is gone. The shyness is gone. The bashfulness is gone. And so as women assume the functional role of men, they begin to lose their femininity. But Allah describes the male and the female in using the analogy of the night and the day. Listen to him. He takes an oath by the night. And that which it shrouds and covers so mysteriously, so beautifully. And he takes an oath by the day and its bright, powerful light. That in the same way that Allah created the night and the day, so too did he create the male and the female. Allah wants the day to be day. And he wants the night to be night. When the day is day and the night is night, do you notice the attraction? How much they are attracted to each other? And when the day is coming to an end and the day is approaching the night, do you notice the anxiety, the enthusiasm, how the day paints the sky in so many colors. Are you blind? Don't you see it? And then when the day reaches the night, the day plunges into the arms of the night. A rush of a plunge into the arms of the night. It happens every sunset. And then the day spends the night with the night. And there's a time for rest, and there's a time for sleep, and there's a time for love, and there's a time for worship, and there's a time for meditation, and then the time comes to say goodbye. And the day must say goodbye to the night. But the night doesn't want the day to go. And so the night holds on to the day. And only one ray of light comes out. <laughs> And then a second ray and a third ray of light. Slowly, slowly, slowly the, the light comes out in the morning. How different from sunset. And so when the day is day and the night is night, there will be intense attraction between the day and the night. It is because of that intense attraction there is a forbidden space between a man and a woman. The forbidden space is not just physical. The forbidden space is also psychological, it's also sociological. It should not be invaded. Hmm? Because of this intense attraction that there is between the male and the female. But when the night wants to become day, Singapore, are you listening? When the night tries to become day, <laughs> in fact, Singapore, the night has already become day. <laughs> when the night tries to become day, the night will no longer be truly night. The day will no longer be attracted to the night. When the night is rivaling the day in the workplace, it's now an adversarial relationship, not attraction. And when the day is no longer attracted to the night, 
what will happen? It's not what will happen, what is already happening. The day will now meet with the day. Wherever the modern feminist revolution and its struggle for women's liberation has taken roots, the necessary corollary has always been homosexuality and lesbianism. But that is not our subject tonight. The slave woman is still down there. And we want to know how will a slave woman give birth to her mistress. When the night tries to become day, not only does the night lose her femininity, but she loses something else that Singapore knows very well. She loses her fertility. She can't have babies. This country has one of the most alarming decline in fertility rates in the world. This island of Singapore. She can't have babies. But she's traveling first class, remember? So then how will babies come? Eventually, the answer is, the slave woman down there, she is too poor to try to become day. <laughs> so her womb is still fertile. And so her womb will now become a factory. Hmm. And she will be paid for her services. For nine months she lived like a queen. No genetically re-engineered food for her. No, real food. No milk with hormones and meat with hormones for her. No, that's for the rest. For her must be real meat and real food. And so for nine months she lives like a queen. Because baby, the first class baby inside there. And then when the baby is born, baby goes first class. Mama, still down in the hole. And so a slave woman has given birth to her mistress. And it has already started. While the scholars of Islam have been eating halwa, it has already started. We are living now in the last age. But the only ones who can read and understand and penetrate the last age, realize the reality of the world around them today, are those who see with two eyes. Not one. Who in addition to the effort that they make to acquire knowledge externally, that effort has to be made. They also are blessed with the capacity for internally derived knowledge. And these two oceans of knowledge come together. Then they could understand and penetrate the reality of the world in which we live today. This has been an introduction to you, an introduction to Islamic spirituality, the forgotten, the forgotten path of knowledge. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may grant that tonight's humble lecture may be a wake-up call and that we may return to this important branch of knowledge and to this effort which must be made which will realize it. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta as-sami'ul alim wa tub alayna ya mawlana innaka anta at-tawwab ar-rahim birahmatika ya arham ar-rahmin. Ameen.